In the prior lesson, we introduced the rules of inference for conditional statements known as modus ponens and modus tollens. In today's lesson, we'll be looking back at these rules of inference to see what happens when the wrong logical steps are taken during the use of these rules. There are two major mistakes that can occur in the use of these rules listed above. Each one of these mistakes corresponds to one of the rules. It is also worth mentioning that both mistakes involve the production of an incorrect second premise of each rule of inference. The first of these two mistakes is called affirming the consequent. This name should be revealing once it is noted that modus ponens is alternatively referred to as affirming the antecedent. Modus ponens takes the form 1, if p then q, 2, p, 3, therefore q, or for only categorical propositions, 1, all a's or b's, 2, c is an a or all c's are a's, 3, therefore c is a b or all c's are b's. This new fallacy affirming the consequent occurs when we reason in the following form. 1, if p, then q, 2, q, 3, therefore p. Or, for only categorical propositions, 1, all a's are b's, 2, c is a b slash all c's are b's, 3, therefore c is an a or all c's are a's. Notice that for the cases with hypothetical propositions, the mistaken formal model switches the second premise and the conclusion of modus ponens. This is a mistake as the conditional only asserts that the truth of p implies that of q, it does not assert the opposite that q implies p, which the mistaken form needs to be a valid argument. For the cases with only categorical propositions, the mistake can be easily seen when we realize that there might be some b's that are not a's. Therefore, just because something is a b does not mean that that thing is an a. This can be easily seen with Euler circles. This set of Euler circles says that both 1, all a's are b's, and that 2, c is a b. However, it shows that 1 and 2 could both be the case while c is not an a. This is contradictory with the conclusion 3. Thus, affirming the consequent for only categorical propositions is also fallacious. The second mistake, denying the antecedent, relates to modus tollens, also known as denying the consequent, in a similar way to how asserting the consequent relates to modus ponens. Modus tollens has the form 1, if p, then q, 2, not q, 3, therefore not p, or, for only categorical propositions, 1, all a's are b's, 2, c is not a b, or no c's are b's, 3, therefore c is not an a, or no c's are a's. An argument making the mistake of denying the antecedent has the form 1, if p, then q, 2, not p, 3, therefore not q, or, for only categorical propositions, 1, all a's are b's, 2, c is not an a, or no c's are a's, 3, therefore c is not a b, or no c's are b's. The reason that this is a mistake is that the conditional links the truth of p to that of q, such that all instances in which p is true also have q as being true. However, there certainly can be cases in which q is the case without p being the case. Examples will make this clearer. It should be noted that these mistakes are so important as they render whatever argument in which they are used as invalid. For the cases with only categorical propositions, the mistake can easily be seen when we once again realize that there might be some b's that are not a's. Therefore, just because something is not an a does not mean that the thing is not a b. This can easily be seen with the same Euler circles. This set of Euler circles says both that 1, all a's are b's, and that 2, c is not an a. However, this is a case where both 1 and 2 are the case, while 3 is not the case. That is, c is a b. Therefore, denying the antecedent is fallacious. In using affirming the consequent and denying the antecedent, true premises no longer lead to assuredly true conclusions. Instead, the conclusions reached are either true by happenstance or in reality false. Mistakes in reasoning of this kind, which forcibly deny the truth of any conclusion reached, are known as fallacies. Fallacies can take two forms. There are formal fallacies, like the ones shown in this lesson, which have to do with the formal structure of arguments and make these arguments invalid. And then there are informal fallacies, in which problems in relation to the propositional content of the premises lead to false conclusions. In the following section, we'll be looking through a couple of examples depicting instances of each of the fallacies listed above. First, affirming the consequent. Suppose you know that if a certain dog can smell things up to one mile away, then it will chase after some animal. 
Now suppose that the dog goes chasing after some animal. From this information, if you were to further conclude that the dog must have been able to smell things up to one mile away, you would be committing the fallacy of affirming the consequent. While the dog did in fact chase after an animal, we are not told whether the dog smelled the animal or whether it used one of its other senses to detect the animal. Because of this, we cannot assuredly conclude that the dog can smell things up to one mile away, as we have no evidence in favor of the truth of this proposition. To see this more clearly, we can formalize the inference as 1. If a certain dog can smell things up to one mile away, then it will chase after some animal. 2. The dog was chasing after some animal. 3. Therefore, the dog must have been able to smell things up to one mile away. Here's the second one. First, all men are mortal. Two, Socrates is mortal. Three, therefore Socrates is a man. It is important to note that while the above syllogism has a true conclusion, it is still fallacious. A fallacious type of inference can sometimes give the true conclusion, but many times it does not. In logic, we care about the types of inference that always give true conclusions if the premises are true. Here's an example of where affirming the consequent fails to give a true conclusion. First, all dogs are animals. Two, Aristotle is an animal. Three, therefore, Aristotle is a dog. We can visualize where we went wrong using Euler circles. Once again, as in the last lesson, suppose that you now know that if someone falls asleep with a lit candle, their room will catch fire. One day, upon asking your parents about your distant cousin, they tell you that they know nothing about your cousin besides the fact that they have never fallen asleep with a lit candle. If you were to follow the path of denying the antecedent, you would reach the conclusion that your cousin's room never caught on fire. This assumption could never be assured by the two premises you received, as there are a multitude of other ways in which your room could catch on fire. Lightning could have stricken the house, or something could have been left on top of the radiator, etc. Given that possibilities of this variety exist, you cannot assume from the premises provided alone that your cousin's room has not caught on fire. To see this more clearly, we can formalize the inference as 1. If someone falls asleep with a lit candle, their room will catch fire. 2. Your cousin has never fallen asleep with a lit candle. 3. Your cousin's room never caught on fire. Hypothetical propositions and categorical propositions are two of the cornerstones of logic and argumentation in general. Last lesson we learned some ways that these statements could be used in arguments to get to true conclusions. This lesson we went over two ways in which they could be used incorrectly in arguments. It is important that the two fallacies which we discussed today are remembered, as these mistakes can easily slip into argument and invalidate it instantly. From this lesson, we learned to identify instances of fallacious arguments following the patterns of affirming the consequent and denying the antecedent, and two, we became aware of the relationship between these invalid argumentative forms and modus ponens and modus tollens.